heart this morning. Come on, just say, Our Father. Hallowed be your name. Come on, say it again. Our Father. Hallowed be your name. We worship you, Father. to verse 52. Amen. They came to Jericho and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him, be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man saying to him, take courage, stand up. He is calling you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. You may be seated. This morning we witness in this passage of scripture a blind man. His name, Bartimaeus, indicates he's unclean. And he does something so phenomenal. He hears Jesus is in town. And in that times, if you were unclean, you were not allowed to go in the crown. But he does something and he goes in the crowd. He was regarded as an outcast to the society. But he cries when he hears that Jesus is in town. And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. He addresses Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. And one would think, you're blind, you need to see. But he cries, mercy. Against custom to shout out, the Bible says he cried out. And when the crowd suppressed him, 
it says he cried out all the more. And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. You weren't allowed to shout at the rabbis or the spiritual leaders in those times. So two things that I see is an outcast is not allowed to go into society. He's not allowed to shout out at any spiritual leader. But the desperation in blind Bartimaeus, he's tired of sitting, the Bible says, he sat and begged at the side of the road. But the cry out all the more, when the voices suppress him, he decides, today is my day. And I just looked in the dictionary, what does it mean to cry out all the more? And it means to make an articulate sound expressing fear, expressing pain, expressing grief, expressing anguish. And he didn't worry how the cry came out but he knew today is my day i must meet the master he's in town the crowds try to silence him but he cries out all the more have mercy on me he knows that if he gets mercy the obvious thing is lord i need to see i'm blind but if i get mercy i get the full package i get jesus's compassion and i get help to regain my sight He draws Jesus' attention. How astounding is this? That he cries so loud, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops in his tracks. The one version says, the other version says, Jesus stopped and said, call him here. But the amazing thing that when they go to him and said, the master is calling you, he takes off his cloak. His cloak being indicative of this way of life, the begging lifestyle. My blindness, sitting on the side of the road, survival mode. Mm. Even though the master knows what he needs, when he gets to Jesus, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? The king of kings, the master knows everything, but still he wants blind Bartimaeus. Acknowledge me as the master. Acknowledge that you need me to change your situation. Jesus says to him, Your faith has made you well. And the Bible says, immediately he regained his sight. A powerful act of redemption. Getting back what was lost. The Bible says he regained his sight, meaning his sight was lost along the path of life. He had sight, he lost it. He became a beggar. And when he decides to follow Jesus, he does something phenomenal. He leaves the old lifestyle. And he immediately follows him. The Bible says, and he followed Jesus on the road immediately. Mm. I don't know what your situation is today, but I know what mine is. But there's a persistent cry out. And not just a cry out, a cry out all the more to bring the master's attention to you today. And when the master responds to you, the question is, Audrey, what would you have me do for you? And Jesus is here today. And he's able to stop. That's the amazing thing that I love about Jesus. When he heard the cry, and he heard the cry out all the more, he stopped Mm. and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Your situation and my situation can change immediately. It's like instant coffee, just like that. No more sitting on the roadside. No more begging. Redemption is your portion this morning, and it's my portion. What we need to do this morning is... Posture yourself like blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is in town. He's here right now. And he's able, and not just able, but more than able, to cause the scales to come off our eyes and to see him as he is. And you know, I want to close with this verse. Sometimes you feel you can't do it. You can't cry out to the master. Because there's voices, there's things that are suppressing you, like the crowd said to him, hey, you're disturbing him. But Psalm 118 verse 5 says, In my distress, I call to the Lord. The Lord answers this morning and he sets us in a large place. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you hear us when we pray. Like blind Bartimaeus, he cried to you. And he cried out, not just a cry, but all the more. And he dressed you as master, son of David. Have mercy on us this morning, Father. You are our help. You grant us compassion in times of need. You restore our sight when we are blind, Father. And you stop in your tracks to hear our cry, Father. And you ask us, what would you have me do for you? You are not just able, but you are more than able. And I bless you, God, that you hear our cry this morning. Don't turn your ear away from us, Father. 
We give you praise, we give you glory and honour for answered prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, family. Good morning. Let's stand this morning. The Bible says in Psalm 68, He's a father to the fatherless. Amen. A defender to the widow is God in His holy habitation. And this morning, the Spirit within us cries out, Abba, Father.
up your hands to him. He's a loving father. It's the highest expression, I believe, of the Godhead. He's chosen to remain invisible. The Bible says no one has seen the father, Jesus said, at any time. He's chosen to remain a mystery. He reveals himself through his son. He sustains and he upholds all things. It's like a background, sturdy element, a solidity that undergirds everything that is happening. In fact, when God said to Abraham, I will make you a father, the word make there means set you as a foundation, set you as a substructure to uphold all things. That's who father is. Father is foundational. The father is that which undergirds. I want to encourage you this morning. Uh, it might seem like your life and your circumstances have been shaken but there's a solidity to things you're not all fallen apart yet you're still there okay just put your hands down and tell someone next to you you're still there tell them you might not be all there but you're still there <laughs> and things haven't really gone all right and like out of control and out of management He's still a father. 
uh, Kamina and Paul's car, uh, Bruce car was stolen yesterday or the day before, I can't remember now. And uh, so I sent them a text, a voice note, just to encourage them in the Lord. I was amazed as to their strength. These things don't define us. These things don't affect our inward disposition. Amen. And I want to encourage you, it might seem like all is teetering and tottering and things are unsteady. But there's a God who is your solidity. There's, an, there's a Father that undergirds. And I love these songs we sang in reference to His dynamic and His makeup as a loving Father. The greatest revelation you can ever come to in Christendom, in Scripture, in the apostolic, I believe, is the revelation that God is my Father and that I am His Son. It's confidence, stability, assurance. Close your eyes for one moment. And if you've never invited Jesus as your Lord and Savior into your life, and you're singing these songs about Father and yet you don't know Him as Father. And you say, God, I want to be your Son. I want this place of assurance. I want this place of confidence. And you say to me, Pastor, I want to give my and surrender my heart to the Lord afresh. Give my life to Him. And surrender it totally to Him and come to know Him as an intimate, loving, dear Father. I want you just to lift your hands to the Lord, everyone. You know, I don't think even those of us who are sons of God already, just solidify and, and anchor this thought deep within your hearts and minds. And for those of you that have never invited Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that right now. In your heart, just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and make me your son. Forgive me of my sins, wash my sins away, cleanse me from every state of wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Make me your son, O oh God. Come on, say, make me your son. I am your son. Come on, I am your son. I am your son. I am your son. No longer slave to sin. I am a son of God. God is my papa. God is my daddy. That's he is. He's father. He's a loving father. He's a loving father. And I want to encourage you this, this morning. Everyone lift your hands. Come on, everyone. I want the whole church just to love the Father and just to celebrate who you are in Him as a son of God. If you've said that prayer and you've said perhaps for the first time, I want to know Him as Father. really want to encourage you to please see us and speak to us after the service. And we will just share some thoughts with you. But I want to encourage you all that God is your Father. God is Papa, God is Daddy. It'll give you confidence in this wicked world. It'll give you assurance. It'll give you hope. It'll anchor your belief system and your life. Amen. Lift your hands. And you are my Father, the source of my life. Born of your Spirit to rule not just Lift your voice and sing it to you. You are my father, the source of my life. One of your spirit to rule, not just survive. I will not leave my own flesh. You are my life, my source, my strength. You are my Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Father, for your enveloping love. Look at the children. Father, look at the children. These of your family standing before you with hands lifted up. These are the children of your inheritance. These are great people. Too many to be numbered. Pray, O oh God, that you would find these, in these, your inheritance in the saints. Fill them. Come on, everyone, lift up your hands. Fill them, I pray. Fill them with your love. Fill them with your fatherhood. 
Fill them with your forgiveness. Fill them with your kindness. Fill them with your assurance. Instill hope and confidence, belief in the name of Jesus. Hope for the future. You are my Father. Hallelujah. You know, when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate said to him, Do you know your life? And I'm paraphrasing. Your life is in my hands. I can do with you whatever I will. You know what the response of Jesus was to Pilate? Very confident. He says, there's nothing that you can do that my father hasn't permitted. All of your dealings with me are within the bounds of my father's permittance. And the confidence of Jesus was always my father. He did mighty works. He said, I don't do them. These are the works of my father. In John 13, it says, Jesus knowing that he came from the Father and he was going back to the Father, disrobed himself, took his garments off, took upon himself garments of his servant and he washed his feet. You see, it's knowledge of where he comes from and the, the fact that God is his Father could allow him to take on any responsibility in earth, even that of menial tasks like a servant, because those things did not define him. He was, his identity was defined by his, by his father. His father gave him a, sh- a sense of assurance, a sense of confidence in life. And I want to encourage you um, to receive that there's a very strong presence here of grace of the father. Just close your eyes for one moment. You see, your obedience in any respect is always conditioned by the confidence you have in father. You could adopt the position of a lowly servant washing others' feet because it says Jesus, knowing he came from the Father, he was going back to the Father. Took upon an apron, a servant's robe, and he washed his disciples' feet. He did not have one moment of independence from his Father. Connected consistently. Amen. God God is here and God is touching your hearts even now. I don't want to miss this moment. Everyone lift your hands and just receive. You know, the, the Father provides. If you, if you are anxious about provision, the Father will provide for you. The Father will, will adequately take care of you. you. You can walk in the midst of great threats even to your personal life. Though I walk in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is confidence in a father. This is confidence in a God that's not just creator, but his father. It's not just Elohim. He's Abba. Abba. Father. I love you. I love you. Abba. Father. I love you. Truly love you. The word Abba is the Hebrew word for father. It's the most intimate of words. In fact, for those of you with Strong's concordances, they're numbered. This is Strong's number one. It's the very first word in the Hebrew lettering or Hebrew alphabet. They teach, say Abba, say Abba. Everyone say Abba. Abba. Say Papa. Papa. Say Daddy. But in the Hebrews, they would say, Abba, Father. The Bible says the Spirit Himself witnesses with, with our spirits that we are the sons of God. And He cries through us saying, Abba, Father. It's a cry. Do you know the worship of ancestors in Africa is a cry for fathering? It's a reversion back to ancestral, patriarchal spirits of their past. But really it's a cry for fathering. And no matter what your natural father has been to you, even close your eyes, no matter what your natural father has been to you, 
whether he's a good father or a bad father is not the issue. Don't take your picture of fathering from them. Because God is far better. He's a gracious, loving, heavenly father. And I want you just to love him for a few seconds this morning. And I want you to lift your hands to him and just worship him. The Bible says his spirit in us together with our spirit cries Abba Father it's a cry it's a cry it's not just a song it's a cry Abba Father it's a cry just sing it Abba Father I love Precious Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, I love you. Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. The Father is a giving Father. And if He resides within you, then the spirit of giving is in you. Could you all repeat after me? Every good gift, every good gift. And, every gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father, comes from the Father. of lights. Of light. In whom there is no shadow of turning, neither variableness. Amen. So let's give liberally and freely as unto the Lord. And I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus in this place. I feel Jesus. Yes, my soul does yearn. Yes, my soul does yearn within me. Burns within me. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. In the 
in this place. Yes, Come on, lift your hands. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel. My soul does burn. Yes, my soul. Come on, to sense in church. It burns within me. Yeah, I feel Jesus. One more time. this uh, so good to be in this place to feel your love for me to feel your love for me to be with you to be with you to worship you to worship so good, so good to be in this place. Come on, you can sing a church. So good to be in this place. So good to be in this place. To feel your love for me. To feel. as possible just hug them just say how's it to someone so good
you may be seated. Good morning, family. Indeed, it is good to be in the place of the Lord this morning. Welcome to all of you this morning. A special welcome to our online viewers. Um, I don't have any visitors recorded, so it's just us, the close family, here to feed off the table this morning. Um, the announcement for the week are as follows. On Wednesday is House Church, which will be via Zoom at 7 p.m., the focus of discussion will be this morning's teaching, so you are encouraged to review the notes and the, the, the video on the YouTube channel in preparation to share your thoughts and insights. A reminder that attendance to these meetings is important, so please make or do your best to be at the meetings. On Friday morning at 5.30 a.m., we will have our regular pre prayer meeting, which is from 5.30 to 6 a.m., on Friday evening at 7 p.m. is our youth meeting for those who are between the ages of 13 and 20. Please make all efforts to attend the youth meeting and we ask parents if you can also encourage your children to attend. More details will be put on the youth WhatsApp group by the youth leadership. Next week, Sunday, we will meet again at quarter past eight for our regular Sunday morning service, and we will also have our fellowship tea straight after church. Please diarize Saturday, the 27th of May, um, where there will be a men's conference at Miracle Ministries in Wentworth at 9 a.m., our father, Pastor Randolph, will be the speaker for the event, so you're encouraged to please attend in support. We would like to wish the following people who celebrated their birthdays this week a very happy birthday. Tazzy, Bentley, Fanele, Shan, Jordan, Mutusami, and Janine, who celebrates her birthday today. We know you all had a special day and were blessed. Um, congratulations to Aaron and Reshma and Brad and Claire who celebrate their wedding anniversary today. We pray that the Lord will continue to bless your union and that you will see many more years together. We are now going to welcome Pastor Randolph who will share the word of the Lord with us. Good morning. Amen. It's wonderful to be in the presence of the Lord. Um, God is here. Amen. I can sense Him very, very strongly. And I'm always very um, aware, not just of His presence, but it's something I prioritize, the fact that I sense Him. And we don't want to just do things routinely, um, just for doing them sake and not sense His proximity and sense His nearness and sense his closeness, so it's wonderful to, to be um, together. Just a few uh, before the, we dismiss the children, uh, Mura is going to be teaching this morning, but before you do that, just one or two announcements. Um, there is this conference that has been held in Port Chepston, Gate Ministries, Port Chepston is hosting it, together in collaboration with other churches, but essentially they are the, the main role players. Um, and Pastor Reggie John, who is our brother in Christ there, is steering this. And I was chatting to him in the past week or so, and we committed as the Durban KZN Sons of Pastor Thamo to lend the conference our total support in every way, financially, uh, our physical presence at the meeting, um, because we perceive purpose. Everyone say purpose. Um, it's not just attending another conference. We want to facilitate purpose, especially the apostolic um, mantle and grace that's attendant with our spiritual father in Christ, Pastor Thamo Naidu, and all the apostolic efforts on the South Coast, KZN, South Coast, and Pushepston is a hub for these activities there. So if you can diarize these dates, they are from a Wednesday to a Friday. It's the first, the second, and the, th the third of, of May. And there are morning and evening sessions. Uh, Pochepson is not too far. 
Okay, it's an hour's drive from Durban. You could drive in for the morning sessions. If anybody would like to go and you want to stay for the morning and evening sessions, you'd like to be accommodated somewhere there in Port Shepson, please talk to me. Uh, Renee and I will be sleeping in Port Shepson, not coming back to and for, for the meetings. Um, um, and there are facilities available there if you wish to stay for the conference sessions throughout the day. But you must communicate with us earliest, as soon as possible, so we can make the relevant plans. If you'd like to drive in for a session or two, if you cannot stay the entirety of the, of the meetings, then please do so. Okay? You must support what God is building. Don't support what God doesn't have his hand on. I'll give your efforts, your energy, your time, and your money to the things that God is, is doing. And we're committed to partnering with them, even to fulfill the financial costs of hosting the conference. So our church will make an offering. The Lord put a figure in my heart, um, but I want to encourage you, if you want to sow into this endeavor, just do that to the church bank account, but put their shippy or PS, we'll know when we reconcile accounts that that must go specifically for this specific conference. Then the next conference in, um, at the end of the year, this I would like this church to give fullest strength to. I committed to Pastor Salvin the support of this local house and our physical resources and financial resources. The apostolic season, at least within our context, within the sphere that is administrated by Pastor Thamo Naidu is at least 30 years old. More than 30, 30 years ago, it will be 30 years in September this year. Um, and also, this dovetails with celebrating the 30th anniversary of River of Life as a church. Now, River of Life Church is like Bethlehem in Judea. Oh, you insignificant Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, you know the hymn, the court, the cattle? What good can come out of you? Great things are born in obscure places. This message was born in Peter Marisburg under Pastor Thamo's custody. And so they're celebrating not just the anniversary of the church, but the anniversary of the movement, the apostolic movement that brings this, the, the church back to biblical accuracy. Many of us attended multiple schools in the time. Um, that we, I, I attended schools, my first school was in 2000 and, 2001, I think, and then I had a three-year break, and I connected with Pastor Thamo again in 2005, September 2005 was my next school, and I think I missed just one school after that, there were two schools held every year, week-long apostolic schools, I think I just missed one, but I think I was present at the rest of them, uh, where we would learn doctrine for one week. So that, that, that PMB represents a cradle, represents an altar, represents a well, represents the birth spot of great things. Um, our alma mater, so to speak, in things apostolic. Go back to where we started. But uh, Pastor Thom is of the view that it's going to be quite a significant event in the realm of the Spirit. So the dates are on your screen, the third to the... 6th of October. It's a Thursday, Friday, and a Saturday. Okay? Um, it's going to be a huge event because an international contingent is all pouring in to this event. The entirety of the Gate Global family will be present because in the week following, we go to our annual retreat at the Drakensberg from the Monday to the Friday after this event. But we had a meeting, while we were in Cape Town, we connected with the Gate Global, Pastor Thomas called a Zoom meeting, and everyone sort of, there was lovely buy-in and pitching to everybody converging on PMB. Now, I would like you all, don't, don't have something on your doorstep and you miss your own moments. Others are flying from Alaska to be here, and you are living 40 minutes drive away, but something so profound comes so close and yet we can miss it, okay? So would you diarize those dates? Um, it's going to be a phenomenal conference. You can drive up and down to PNB if you wish, um, or you can, you can uh, live at one of the hotels. Oh, well, Peter Madison doesn't have many. <laughs> but um, Pastor Salvin is working vociferously. I chatted with him in the week, um, and he was talking about securing this hotel and that hotel. And those details will be forthcoming. 
Amen. Would you try your best to be here? Yeah? Let, let's, let's go and, you know, we lend support. Your presence is not just physically supporting a thing. Um, uh, we were talking as the KZN uh, group. We said we're going to Sheppey not to be physically present. We're going to make a statement in the realm of spirit. This is not our brother's initiative. This is our initiative. We're buying, we're hosting it corporately, okay? So please um, pin in those dates and save them. And then there's the conference with Lynn, Dr. Lynn Hybels in, uh, what is it? Lynn Hill, sorry, I think Hybels. In, in Stanton that Pastor Thamo is hosting. It's the Apostolic Leadership Summit. That takes place in Stanton from the 17th to the 19th of May. Yeah, again, I think it starts on a Thursday. Thursday? Yeah, Thursday evening, I think it starts. Oh, Friday, sorry. Friday evening, the Saturday, and obviously the Sunday. We are simply are going to drive up or fly in, but we'll be back late Saturday evening so we can be in church on Sunday. Okay? Um, um, this is a new voice that Thamo, Pastor Thamo is has invited to speak to the Gate family. I haven't heard him before, neither has Pastor Thamo. I think Pastor Thamo just heard one message from him. He comes very, very highly recommended. One of those voices that God has kept in obscurity that's now coming to the fore. I understand he's in the caliber of Kelly Ivana. Uh, if you know Kelly, uh, he passed away. I've got many of Kelly's books on my shelf. Um, Dr. Woodruff described Varner as a walking word. And if this man is equated to that caliber of minister, then um, we would encourage you to go up and to hear him. Um, his, his strength is eschatology and grace. But for this conference, his, his focus is on the grace of God for this conference. Okay? And so I will encourage you to go up. Why? Our Father is hosting us. I support anything. My Father just does it. I am there. I don't question. I shift everything. I shift plans, purposes. No cost is too great. And I make my way to hold up the hands of my Father, like an Aaron and an her. For that reason, secondly, to, to hear Lynn, Dr. Lynn, and receive grace, right? But also, thirdly, I would like as many of us as possible to go to see the culture of Gate Center. To see how things are done, levels of excellence, levels of protocol. Some things are more caught than taught. Yesterday I was at the NCF uh, uh, business breakfast. I was amazed. There was not, there was not, if I would give them 110% on 100% for excellence. There was not one, not even one court out of place, that detail. It was just fine. It was fit for a king, right? From the management of the program, three sessions were held with three speakers uh, regarding kingdom business. It was just phenomenal, phenomenal. You, you just get impartation just by the context. When you come in there, you see this is a table fit for a king, right? And I want us to upgrade. Everyone say upgrade. Upgrade, upgrade everything. Upgrade your mindset Upgrade the way we set chairs out. There should be no row that is crooked here. Alignment, um, everything must be done with excellence. If you have wisdom, it must translate to, to excellence. Last time I told you, but how do you write a WhatsApp message? They even spoke about that yesterday in their presence. How do you write an email? What is the levels of your conversation? Are there any grammatical errors in there? What is your representation and your presentation to the world? If this house is going to receive kings, we have to craft a context to receive them. Amen? Everyone say receive kings. Amen? And I want everyone to upgrade. You are kings. You are not ordinary scum. You are king's kids. You are royal priesthood. You think differently. You behave differently. And I want to encourage you, whenever these things come, up, come to us, take advantage of being present at these things. Uh, you notice my modus operandi, I support my father 110%. I go to other contexts as well, at his blessing, with his permission, so I can glean and I can, and I can learn from various, because we don't have it all. Tell someone we don't have it all. Even Pastor Thomas said, not even, not even the Gates Global has it all. That's why we have to collaborate. 
with others. And even Dr. Lynn's coming from a different stream, different grace, different methodologies, different protocols, but coming in to enrich the great global family. It's a day for excellence. Tell someone a day for excellence. Amen. Everything you do. Even the way you skip. I was skipping at half past ten in the evening last night. Skipping away because I ate four crunchies. I thought, I'm not, hey, I'm not sleeping with these calories in my system. And I took my skipping rope and just for half an hour went to town, sweating, etc. And even I was skipping away, they said, Lord, I'm being excellent with the way I skip. Right? Even that, when someone says, check how he skips, he skips like a king. <laughs> Tell someone excellence. Say exactness. Right? Everything you do must be precise, must be ordered, must be must be excellent. That is where we are going to. Gavin and, S and uh, Samantha leave today to Dubai at 2 o'clock, so they may slip out if you see them. I'm not sure if they're gonna how long they're going to stay. I'm not sure what time your flight is. But even the, I commend you for coming to the service, even though you're leaving this afternoon for, for Dubai. They're attending a church conference there with members of their, their own family as well. And so you are in our thoughts and in our, and in our prayers. Amen. Wonderful to see you, Sherwin. Son in Christ. Hallelujah. All will be well. Amen. Lovely to see you. Amen. Bronwyn, lovely to see you. You are regarded by heaven. Amen. Amen. Who else did I miss? Don't pick it. I say me, me, me. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. Stand, brother. Nkuleleko, should we call you doctor or what now? <laughs> Wonderful to see you as well. Amen, lovely to have you with us. And your growth in Christ has been phenomenal when I think about where you come from and your journey. And so just stay the course, amen. The kids may be dismissed. Thank you, Moira, for... Amen. This morning, we're going to continue with the spirit of prayer, and this is part 17, and I want to again look at 1 Kings chapter 3, and look at principles governing a prayer for wisdom. We've read this text, and we've prosecuted some matters in reference to Solomon's request for wisdom, and I want to reread it, and then look at a few more principles for your consideration. Remember, these will also be discussed at House Church on on Wednesday. So let's look at 1 Kings chapter 3. Now Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh king of Egypt and, look, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and a wall around Jerusalem. The people were still sacrificing on the high places and there was no house port for the name of the Lord until those days. Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in his statutes of his father David, except that he was sacrificing and burning incense on the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, because there was a great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give to you. Open check. Ask me anything and I will give it to you. Solomon said, you have shown great faithfulness to your servant, David, my father, according as you walk before you in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have reserved for him this great faithfulness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O oh Lord God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Yet I am a little boy. I do not know how to go out nor to come in. And your servant is in the midst of this, your people, which you have chosen. 
A great people, everyone say a great people. A great people were too many to be numbered or counted. So, everyone say so. In the light of that, so. When you say so, based upon what I've just described, God, so. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is capable of judging this great people of yours? Now it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. That is where we want to be. Whenever we ask, it must be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Everyone say it. Pleasing in the sight of the Lord. When God sees, not when He hears, when God sees a prayer. In the sight of the Lord. And eyes there, not, ear, not ears or reference, but eyes speak of perspective, perception, and penetration. There's a divine view that God has of you when you frame words in prayer. It's not that just what you say must be pleasing, but what He sees. And it's more than sounding of words. It's disposition. It's attitude. It's the heart of the one who prays. Billy and Seer again sing a song, Oh, may I be pleasing to see when holy eyes gaze upon me. Oh, may I be pleasing to see in his eyes. Everyone say, in his eyes. In his eyes. Don't boast about the fact that you pray much and people have a view of you that you are a man or a woman of prayer. The true perspective and assessment must come from heaven that when God sees, God is pleased. Prayer, say this with me, prayer must please God, not please me. You can't pray with self-pleasure in mind, self-gratification in mind. Your prayer must be pleasing to the Lord. Whatever the issue is for which you are praying, my heart is God at the end of the day, at the end of the Friday morning prayer meeting. May it be pleasing in your sight. May it bless your heart. May not I move off that prayer meeting feeling good, and yet God is frowning. Right? May it be pleasing in your sight. Okay? And this verse really grabbed me. Of all the verses in this chapter, may it be ple the prayer that he prayed, it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked for this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked for this thing, everyone say this thing. I don't know if I'll get to it, but there's something called this thing. There's a thing that you need to focus on, which if you focus on, gets you every other thing that you didn't even ask for. Everyone say this thing. Because you've asked for this thing, which is you asked for wisdom, right? God said you asked for this thing and you have not asked for yourself long life. You have not asked for riches for yourself. You've not asked for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice, discretion, discernment, wisdom, to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and a discerning heart. And I pray for all of you, young and old, that you live life at work, at school, at university, in your marriage, at your gym, at your place of leisure, your place of enjoyment, however you traverse, that you live life with wisdom. You, you become very, very discerning and you adjust your behavior so as to be wise, um, to operate with skill. Remember I said wisdom is to operate with, with skill. I heard a clip, we were listening to, uh, my, my sister-in-law is living with us the past two weeks, recovering from a knee up. And Nelda, Renee and I were listening to a, a message by Sam Solin called The Orphan Spirit released recently at Vishnu Sir Prasad's church in Trinidad. Wonderful session, you must listen to it. The Orphan Spirit. And he opens the teaching with that he constantly prays for wisdom, he said. Constantly prays for, for three things, he said. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Everyone say knowledge. knowledge. Understanding and wisdom, right? And he explained it like this. He said, knowledge is the what. Everyone say the what. So the facts, information, knowledge is the, the what. And then understanding 
He said, is the why. When you seek to understand, you don't just want to know what is, but why what is the way it is. Understanding probes, probes deeper. And then he said, wisdom is the how. Everyone say the how. Wisdom is the how, all right? So it's, everyone say knowledge, knowledge. Understanding. understanding, wisdom, wisdom. right? Knowledge is the what, understanding is the why, but wisdom is the, the how. Now that I know knowledge, I know what, I have understanding the why, I understand the dynamics for why, what exists the way it is. Wisdom says, how do I engage this now with skill to make it work for me, or let's say to solve a problem or to navigate a particular issue with with, with skill and success. Now, more and more, it's dawning upon me. I took decisions this week over which I was mulling over, um, seriously mulling over, and I'm really, I was really praying, God, how do I do this? The question is how? I know, I know the issues at stake. I think I have an understanding of factors at play. How do I walk through this? And I believe God gave tremendous, tremendous wisdom. It was just confirmed yesterday. Um, but you can't just blindly go into things. You can't just blindly based upon sentiment and emotion and just move into things. You've got to walk carefully. Your steps have got to be measured. You've got to walk with skill. Everyone say walk with skill. Uh, walk with skill. I, I looked at, I was, uh, looked, I came across, I stumbled across a video of a ninja on YouTube, I think two days ago. One of the last surviving, they say, expert ninjas. And this guy, they showed his skill with the sword. I don't want to be near him when he's around with it, he's got a sword next to him. It was simply amazing the feats he could do with such precision and with such skill, such alacrity. <laughs> And uh, the man was so agile in his, in his ageness. Um, and I said, God, I want that kind of preciseness, that kind of skill. Solomon asked for wisdom. God, give me this capacity. And God gave it to him. Let me finish reading the text. I have done according to your words. I've given you a wise and a discerning heart. There'll be no one like you before you, nor shall anyone arise after you. Verse 13, I've given you what you have not asked for. Now, this is wonderful when you ask for something and you get what you don't ask for. Everyone say that one thing. I don't think I'll get to it, but we'll do that maybe next week if the Lord permits. Um, there's things you must focus on that get you other things you did not ask for. The things if you ask for will limit your times on praying for things that you really need, that you don't need to spend time in prayer for because you focused on the thing that was most essential. I've given you what you've not asked for, riches, honor. There'll be no one like you, kings like you, all your days. Verse 14, and if you walk before me, keep my statutes and commandments as your father David did walk, then I will prolong your days. In the past session two weeks ago, we looked at a couple of principles. Firstly, and we had a house church meeting on this. I won't go into detail. That imperfection does not... Um, negate your, your divine purpose or reception of divine uh, provision. Um, in this passage, there was a high regard for, for fathering, right? There was an understanding that God builds generationally because he referenced both his father David, remember? Uh, and he, he knows he comes from a generational line. He's not his own thing doing, his own man doing his own thing in his own time. He's part of a continuum a perpetuation of legacy through time. And um, it dawned upon me, even uh, in the prayer meeting, when we prayed for Silo, one of the prayer meetings, and I read that passage where King, uh, who was it? Hezekiah asked for um, God to deliver him from the Assyrian attack. He referenced, God said, you come from a line. You come from uh, a Davidic line, right? And sometimes God rescues you because of your connection to a greater purpose. It's not about you, Hezekiah. Dealing graciously with you because of your connection to Davidic promises. 
And I really want to encourage you to enter the labors of others that have gone on before you. And we, we spoke to that. Just for today, because of time, let me just get straight into it. What other principles can govern or facilitate your reception of wisdom? In Solomon, yes, he was linked to the past. He had a father. He was concerned about generational building. God offloads wisdom to a man of that caliber. If you are isolationist, individualistic, and seek to do your own thing and fulfill your own whims and not build into a greater whole bigger than you, the, your, your reception of wisdom will be limited. God is not obliged to give wisdom to someone that's not going to use it for a greater purpose. And I really want to encourage you, the more you're disposed to fulfilling the purposes managed by spiritual fathers apostolically, the greater your deposit and reception of the wisdom of God that will come to you. Look at verse 6. The next principle is this. I entitled it a servant, serving mentality. Everyone say a serving mentality. In verses 6 to 10, look at what Solomon said. You have shown great faithfulness to your servant David. Everyone say your servant David. Solomon references his father, both natural and spiritual. David's my natural and spiritual father, but David is your servant. Everyone say my servant David. Look at verse 7. And now, O Lord God, you have made your servant king. Now he's referencing himself. David is a servant, but me, God, I too am what? I am your servant. Look at verse 8. And your servant is in the midst of your people. Look at verse 9. So give your servant. These references to servant are no coincidence. It doesn't say give your king. There's no pride in Solomon constantly references himself as one who is who has the position but is not there to serve his self-interest you know especially in our nation okay you, you guys know the story people occupy positions that are self-serving right they're there to feather their own nest pull their own kingdoms a lot of corruption sam solon taught us the first order of leadership is this a leader serves for the benefit of those under his leadership a ruler rules for the benefit of those under his rule. All right? A president presides over a nation because of the benefit for the nation and not for his self-benefit. A mayor gives administration to a city for the benefit of the citizens of the city and not for his own um, interest. A principal leads a school not for his own benefit but for the benefit of his staff and his learners. Any leadership position is for the benefit of everybody under your jurisdiction. If you're going to lead, you must have a serving mentality. They call it servant leadership today in leadership circles. But you also got to be fatherly in your leadership disposition. And true fathers do serve. While sons serve, fathers serve as well. And I want to encourage you all, seek to benefit another. Tell someone that, seek to benefit another. Seek to benefit another. Um, we've been ministering the gospel to so many people recently. It seems like a wave of evangelism has overtaken my house, both of us. And we had to counsel someone even on Friday. Um, that uh, A colleague, ex-colleague of mine referred them to us and um, invited uh, uh, we to adjust our schedule. But we did it gladly. But it was so wonderful to have a broken person come in to the office and we spend time with them and speak to them about the wisdom of God that comes from His Word. And to see the relief the person has as they will walk out. Right? And, and, as, and we got no vested interest. All we want to do is help, help someone. All we want to do is help someone get on. And I want to encourage you all, live for the benefit of others. When I say serving, a servant is exactly that. You don't fulfill your own wishes and desires. You live for the benefit of, you live for the benefit of others, okay? I was working vociferous in the office in the week, and they rattled, the gate rattled. It was my regular customer. <laughs> One of the beggars that keeps coming. 
And I was so into what I was doing. I thought, Lord, should I just ignore this or what? But I felt very convicted. I said, okay, put this aside. Hi, what do you want? He says, I'm hungry. Okay, great, I'll make you something. Time, uh, took 10 minutes of my time, made the juice, made it, give it to him. Get back to the office. Um, everyone says serving mentality. The more you have this, the more God is disposed to give you wisdom. You might not see the connection, but God's not going to offload wisdom to someone that's not orientated to bless the world, to bless others. If you're always inwardly focused, then God is not going to offload such significant deposits to you. If you look at Acts chapter 6, even the seven deacons chosen to serve tables. It says, so the 12, Acts 6 verse 2, remember there was a problem, the widows were being neglected and the apostles chose seven men to serve widows food daily in the temple. There was specific requirements set out for the seven deacons chosen, right? So the 12 apostles summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order, everyone say, serve. Notice that the heart here is tables need to be, tables needed to be served. And service must come back to the body of Christ. I'm finding the body of Christ globally is becoming lazy to serve. It's all about my personal comfort, my personal well-being, the degree to which my personal needs are met, and hardly anybody is making sacrifices anymore. We're leaving the culture of sacrifice. And to serve will cost you. Right? To serve will cost you um, time, schedule, energy. It's going to cost you. Someone's going to invade your, your program. And it, it cannot simply be comfort as your orientation. Right? You've got to come into a place of disadvantage in order to advantage somebody else. Right? Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 says the following, that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. So Jesus is rich, but he became, it was a became poor. Deliberate impoverishment to in deliberately enrich others. Deliberate self-inconvenience to convenience others. Deliberate self-disadvantage to advantage another. And Paul says, this is grace. Everyone say, this is grace. If we as apostolic people claim to be full of grace, and the apostolic churches are big on grace. We often sing about it. We are graceful. Grace is access, apostolic grace. Well, I say to you, if grace is present, show me in your life to what degree does that grace inconvenience you to convenience another. To what degree is that grace uh, uh, disadvantaging your life, your schedule, your finances in order to enrich a, another. Servitude. Everyone say servitude. I want this church to be a serving church. And notice, go back to Second uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 2. The issue was serving tables, right? Look at the next verse. Who did they choose to do this? Therefore, brethren, select seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and what? Full of wisdom to serve tables. Wisdom is given to those who serve, right? Those who serve must have wisdom. Wisdom is present to engage service. You want your wisdom allotment to grow, but you're serving nothing. It's not going to happen. You want your wisdom allotment to grow, but it's all about you and not about anybody else. Ask your neighbor, are you serving anything? Ask him, are you giving anything to any, any institution? Any? Is your life all about you? Is it just gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy? Or is there an outflow of things moving out from you, right? Your time, your, your energy. I know, Corrine, you volunteered you much of your time and energy there at the police station over the years. Let me say, the Lord sees that. 
And wisdom is granted to those who serve. Right? Wisdom is granted to those who serve. Okay? Look at David. Remember, look at Acts 13, verse 36. And I challenge you with this. Solomon said, your servant David, my father, your servant, is no more. Then he references himself. Now you have made your servant king instead of David, my father. What kind of a servant was David? We could spend a whole message on this, but just one verse for now. Um, this says, for David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, right, fell asleep, and he was laid among his fathers, and he underwent decay, his body degenerated. Look at this. Everyone say, he served the purposes of God. Say it louder. He served the purposes of God. That must be on my epitaph, my tombstone. Here lies Barney. He served the purpose of God, full stop. That's all. That, I think, is the greatest commendation. He served the purpose. Ask your neighbor, are you what are you serving? Are you serving the purposes of God? Yeah? This, this message is very serious to me. You know why? It's pointless praying for a thing if you haven't fulfilled the requirements that get the thing to you. For example, I can't pray for anybody for financial breakthrough that doesn't give. Giving is the pathway to your financial prosperity. I can spend 40 days fasting and praying for you. I, my prayer can be zealous, fervent, sincere. Nothing will move because in your life you haven't fulfilled the requirements. And I'm saying to us, we can pray for wisdom, pray for wisdom, but if there's no servant mentality... Wisdom is not going to come. David served the purposes of God in his own generation. Look at the New King James framing, or King James. New King James. Let's look at New King James. David, after he served his own generation by the will of God. Right? So this says it slightly differently. In ASB says he served what? It would say he served the purposes of God. The New King James says he served his own generation by the will of God, right? So there's no contradiction in this because when you do serve the purposes of God in your generation, you do serve your generation by the will of God, right? And this scripture really meant much to me in meditation this week. You know why? God said to me, Randolph, are you serving your generation by my will, right? Are you fulfilling my mandate on your life so that this generation, that this Ray, that this Caleb, that this Levi, my grandsons, that these spiritual sons in Great in Gate Ministries, Durban Central, after you've gone and you're dead and no more, can they say he served his generation by the will of the Lord? Will people miss you after you're dead? Well, ask your neighbor that. Will you be missed, bro? Will you be missed? <laughs> or will they say, thank you, Jesus. Good riddance, he's gone. <laughs> or she's gone, she's no more. There's actually a verse like that concerning firstborn sonship. I'll teach it later when we do the series. One king died and the people said, good riddance. Everyone clapped. They held a party. The man is gone. Right? People mustn't celebrate your departure. People must miss you and mourn, mourn it. But what impact? Everyone say impact. Are you making a dent anywhere? Is someone, someone's life um, being affected by you in, in any way? Yeah? We felt to, to celebrate um, one of our instructors at, at the gym's birthday in the week. And the Lord just prompted it. And we had a birthday cake taken there. After the workout, we presented it to him. And um, he sent a message via IG afterwards uh, expressing he's never felt love in the way he did on that day, right? Now, I'm a son of God planted in a grid class. I gridlocked the thing. <laughs> I go there to train because I want to get fit, but I'm constantly aware, function with skill, function with wisdom here. Yeah. Function with representation. 
you've come to receive, you will get benefit of being more fitter. Yes, but even serve the purposes of God in that context. Don't just go there and think, Randolph, your fitness, your good time, that one hour of training. Don't just think that. I want you to go to every context. Who loves going to work on a Monday morning? Come on, all your hands should be up. Yes, that's the time to manifest the kingdom. I hope you, say, I hope you don't say, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> you should be saying, thank God it's Monday. Can't wait, God. I'm going to go there. I'm going to be like a virus in the system. My boss is going to thank God he employed me. I will serve his, the interests of my boss. Uh, he must know, like, like Pharaoh did concerning Joseph. Pharaoh was convinced. My household is blessed because of you. So glad I employed you on that day. Huh? Be a blessing to your context. Right? Don't irk your environment. Bless your environment. Seek to be a, seek to be a, a blessing. I always try this to be like this wherever, in whatever context I, I am found. Yeah? So I got to the function yesterday morning, and I sat at the table. I just knew one person, two people at the table. So as I got there, uh, they were quiet, got up, hi, I'm Randolph, and I introduced myself. And we got talking like a house on fire, like we were all, old friends. I'm saying, be the difference. Everyone say, be the difference. Be the difference. You know why some of you are so stuck <laughs> and full of yourself that there's no space for anybody else because you're too full of yourself. It's all about you. Come in there. Your mind is not who can I bless, who can be advantaged because of my presence here. It's all about, it's all about inward gratification. It's never about things flowing outside of you. I want to encourage you, the more you adopt serving, everyone say serving, a serving mentality, wisdom is going to befall you. God will give you grace and God will give you wisdom. So tell someone, serve a generation. Publicly speaking, a generation is at least 40 years span. When they say a generation, at least a 40 year span. And I want to encourage you, do something, that business you wanted to start, get it off the ground. That initiative you wanted to start, get it off the ground. Um, that good deed you wanted to do to some good friend that needed a good deed done, a good email, a task, whatever, just do it. Some of us rationalize too much if we're ever planning and nothing gets, nothing gets done. Just take the bull by the horns and start to serve. Serve everyone. If you're a principal at, if you're a teacher at some school, your principal must thank God the day you came into that school. You must be a blessing beyond measure. If you are at a bank, Wesley, your superiors must thank God the day Wesley came. Right? Uh, th this bank has never been the same again. Right? You've got to be infectious in, and an influence in your, in your environment. Okay? Uh, it, it, must, it must take place. I bought four books at the, at, the, at the occasion yesterday. Dr. Tich, whom I met two years ago, was just one of the speakers. And, um, and he got four new books out, all on finances, business, etc. And I bought it. And I got, already got four of his other books on my shelf back home. I saw the books, four books I had, so the four new ones as I walked in. Okay, I'll take those four. And I bought it. I went into the meeting. And while in the meeting, I'm thinking, I can't read this. And Pastor Thambo can't read this. And before they were just about to start, I immediately walked out and I bought all eight as a gift for my father in the Lord. Right? What am I thinking? How can I be so blessed with all this material and my father not have access to it? Right? Now, everyone say serve. Costly, yes, but serve. You benefit her, you benefit another. Okay? Now, there's a verse that we came across in the book of Psalms when we read the Psalms that like it, it really haunted me. <laughs> Even the verse haunts you. <laughs> it's Psalm 73 and verse 15. Not haunts me in a negative sense, but God used it to really challenge me. David said this, if I had said, oh, let me just paint the context. For those of you who know Psalm 73, the wicked are prospering. He's worried about the wicked are prospering, etc. Nothing's happening in his, in his own life, etc. Remember at the end of this, he says, until I went into the sanctuary, then I understood the end, etc. 
And so in his complaint disposition, the wicked are prospering, nothing is moving in his life. And in his depression and in his discouragement, he tends to speak inaccurately. Because he says, if I had said, I will speak like this, I will speak thus, behold, I would betray the generation of your children. Right? Now David's very aware that I better watch my attitude here. I'm discouraged, I'm depressed because the wicked are prospering. And I have a tendency now to speak ill-advisedly, to speak without um, knowledge or understanding, to speak out of turn. And my speaking is going to betray a whole generation. The New King James says, If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would be untrue to the generation of your children. Now David served those, he served his generation by the will of God. And yeah, he, he echoes a fear that inaccurate speech because of not fully understanding a specific circumstance that he's in can actually betray or be untrue to a whole generation. Now what I really want to focus on just quickly is if you want wisdom, watch your mouth. If you want wisdom, watch what you say. Be like David. Behold, if I say this, I'm actually going to negate the reception of wisdom and betray a whole generation of, of people. My fear, when I say the scripture haunt me, my fear was this, God may it never be said of me at the end of my tenure on earth, man of you betrayed a whole generation. You spoke ill-advisedly. Right? Uh, you spoke wrongly. You spoke with malice. You spoke with complaint. And instead of blessing a generation, you've actually betrayed a whole generation. You know, it's one thing to betray a family, but to betray a whole generation is a serious thing. To be untrue to a whole group of people is a serious thing. I want my life to be like when David, that when before he slept, he served the, his generation or he served the purposes of God in his generation. Okay? This generation must be blessed because you are alive. Right? This generation must be blessed. If you shut down your Facebook profile, they must miss you. Where is he? Okay, a good friend of mine shut his down recently. I'm saying, where is he? So blessed by what he, what he says constantly. I want to encourage you. Be a blessing. If I can leave you with anything, serve. Everyone say serve. Serve some greater purpose. Be a blessing, right? Be a blessing. In closing, because of time, the one area of service that you can be is to serve your spiritual father, um, your spiritual leader. Serve as in supportive leadership. I wrote a thick document like that called Strong Support for Spiritual Leadership. If any of you want to study it, I'll, I can send it to you. It's a PDF. It's a very long, long, lengthy document. I don't want to teach that here. It's a long, long, long story. Case study of the case study of how those who served their, their fathers in Christ came into great blessing, great wisdom. And Solomon is now serving the purposes of God vested in his father, David. And he references David. God offloads wisdom to him. We were um, at our Zoom meeting that was held in via Zoom about two weeks ago when we were in Cape Town. Uh, we arrived in Cape Town on the Monday. The Zoom meeting was the whole of Tuesday afternoon. It was a three-hour meeting. Um, and uh, or, or thereabouts, and Pastor Thamo asked me to do the invocation on the table of the Lord. The, the person, Anthony, was scheduled to do it, but he was stuck on a flight from traveling from India, coming back home. And so he said, can you quickly, I said, no problem. And so I, sh I just read First Kings 3, and then the Lord began to share a whole lot of things with the Gate family. And then in his comment afterwards, Pastor Thamo made a very valid, valid contribution. He said the prayer for wisdom, the wisdom you pray for might not be given to you personally, but will be located in your father. Remember I said to you, Paul called himself a wise master builder. Remember I said to you, Paul 
was an apostle, a spiritual father, and he was full of wisdom. And he came to Corinth and he said, I have wisdom that you need. Okay? Whenever I hear my father in the Lord, it's like a fountain of wisdom that just pours forth effortlessly. Sometimes I hit myself, oh, when will I ever be like him? <laughs> oh, when will it ever flow so naturally and so, so reflexively? That's my, and I realize I need to tap into higher wisdom to receive wisdom. The wisdom you, re you want could be packaged in the Father that you serve. And as you adopt servitude, wisdom will, wisdom will come to you. Why does Paul write to Timothy the way he does? He wrote two long letters to him, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, right? These are letters of wisdom from a father to a, a father to a son. And you don't know better. Let's pause there. Sila. Your father knows better. Your father has skill, sagacity that is God-given to you but vested in their person. And it takes great humility to regard the fact that I don't know, or I don't know as I should, but there's someone who knows far better, far wider, has a view of things. And sometimes you don't need to pray for a thing. You don't need to pray about a thing. You simply need to listen to the advice of a father. And the father speaking will sort your issues out, right? It is pride to say, I will pray about it. If the fountain of wisdom in a father says, this is the way, walk in it, right? If Pastor Thamo tells me one thing, I will not even pray about it. I will say when, how, what? What is to be done? What must we, what must we do, okay? And I want to encourage us. Uh, Psalm, what was that Psalm? Was it Psalm 130, 131, I think. Remember in here, wisdom is given, maybe let me just focus quickly on this principle. Wisdom is given to the person that acknowledges their ignorance. Right? First Kings 3 and verse 7. What did Solomon say? Just watch this. Please, I want you to concentrate. God is speaking here. Um, God said this, um, now, O oh Lord, Solomon said, you have made your servant king in my, the place of David, my father. Yet I am a what? I'm a little child. A little child speaks of what? Inexperience, immaturity, right? Inexperience, immaturity. Now, say this after me. Say, I don't know how. I say it louder. I don't know how. Some people know it all. And these words will never issue from their mouths. I don't know what to do. The phrase going in or out and in is a phrase for leadership. If you just, if you have a Bible program, search this phrase, go out, come in. Most times in the Old Testament, particularly, it's used in John chapter 10 as well when Jesus speaks about the good shepherd. It's about how people, our leaders lead people from one position to a next. Take people from A to Z. Solomon's the new leader. He's saying, I don't know how to go out and come in. Remember when, when David was crowned king at Hebron, what did the men say to him? He said, when Saul was king, you led us out, you led us in. Not so? It's a descriptor of how leaders impact people, take us in. So what Solomon is saying here, David's dead, I'm the new king. I have no capacity to take to transition a whole group of people from this place to where they should be God. I'm inexperienced. I'm immature. I'm ignorant. Three things. I'm inexperienced. I'm immature. I'm totally ignorant. I don't have a clue about this thing called kingship. And you put me here. <laughs> I like what he said. Watch. Everyone say, you have made. It's like, you put me here. So sort me out. <laughs> he's not saying I wanted this position I never applied for this God you put me here say this out loud you put me here and let me just say this to you uh, Carla was saying to us you heard a testimony how she got this managerial position 
And when she, uh, when she first told us about it, she called it, she was saying, initially, this verse came to her, God, it's way beyond my expertise, but you put me here. Now, I want to prophesy to you, all of you again. I feel so strongly. Many of you are going to come into roles for which your, your natural training disqualifies you for. You're going to come into experiencing certain opportunities, divine moments in God. And you're going to feel totally inept, not in having any capacity, no idea as to how effectively you're going to do this. And this has happened. It's happened to Carla. It's going to continually happen to many of you. Now, if you will receive that, I want you to believe it. Expect some sudden promotion to a realm for which you are totally not naturally prepared for. But then you're going to need the wisdom of the heavens. You're going to need the wisdom of God. But don't be proud. Be like Solomon. I'm immature. I'm inexperienced. I don't know how God. Right? Don't come to God with a know-it-all attitude. Right? Don't come to God with saying, Lord, I've done this thing before me. I know it all. Everyone say humility. <laughs> Haven't you not read throughout the book of Proverbs how wisdom is given to the humble? Over and over again, we read that wisdom is given to the humble. Psalm 131, I think it is, I was reading. I think it's there. Where David said, I behave myself or something. But look at verse, look at verse 1. I think. Yeah. He said, my heart is not proud. Right? nor my eyes haughty, and I like this, nor do I involve myself in great matters or things too difficult for me. There are some people that know everything. <laughs> right? They're better even than Google. <laughs> they Google all by themselves. Right? And many people don't recede and admit their deficiency. Yeah. Nishi, Pastor Nishi, Singh said she can, um, how did she say it? She can understand somebody not knowing a thing, but there's no excuse for having no desire to find out the thing that you don't know. Find out the thing that you don't know. Amen. Look at the next verse. Surely I have composed and I've quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against its mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. And I want to encourage you. Behave yourself. Someone say, behave yourself. The King James says, I've behaved myself. You know? I've just accepted my metron, my limitations. Let me just say this to you. If you accept your limitations, God can work with you. But God can never work with someone that believes they know it all, and uh, can do all. God responds to an acknowledgement of inexperience, immaturity, and ignorance. God respects that person. If that's your heart, Solomon, I can offload because you're not full of anything. In fact, you've emptied yourself of everything. Now I can fill you with my, with my wisdom. Okay? Now, quickly. Everyone say, serve your fathers. Just quickly. Can we take another 10 minutes? It's a lovely cold day. No one's going anywhere today, brethren. <laughs> Amen. We seldom get to teach as we should. Church is training time. Church is fine honing. When King Jabin, you'll read this for your reference in Judges chapter 4. Read Judges chapter 4 today and chapter 5. When King Jabin, or Jabin as some people say, was defeated, and he was defeated, this wicked king, by the combined efforts of Deborah, Barak, and Jael. Remember Jael? Deborah, Barak, and Jael. They defeated this wicked king. Uh, there was an absence of leadership in their day, and God raised up these three individuals, especially Barak and Deborah, to lead and to extract wickedness from the nation. Then judges, and it was successful. So afterwards, Judges chapter 4, Judges chapter 5, Judges chapter 6, you must read. So after the defeat of Jabin, Deborah writes a song. She was a songstress as well. Deborah and Barak 
Judges 5, 1 and 2. Deborah and Barak and the sons of Abinoam sang on that day, saying that the leaders led in Israel and the people volunteered. Bless the Lord. Very simple thing. Look at verse 1 again. Right? Verse 2, sorry. Let, let's read this together. Say, the leaders led. The, leaders the, people, volunteered. the people volunteered. Bless the Lord. <laughs> Simple, right? The leaders led. The people volunteered. Bless the Lord. God is blessed when leaders lead and people volunteer. Now, the volunteering dynamic in the kingdom of God is slowly losing its, its strength. No one is serving anything. No one is volunteering for anything anymore, right? And I want this house to volunteer. So, for example, I said to Pastor Selvin, when you guys celebrate the tears, I said, I, I commit to you our physical human resources, right? Be it car guards, be it serving as tables, there's been a lot of international guests. We are the host. We're going to host with them. Everyone say, serve a greater purpose. And I'm telling you, God blesses the faithful who serve. Have you volunteered anything for any activity? Let's say in this church, is your mindset, I'm coming, what is pastor and the group and everyone that's working behind the scenes, what do they have for me today? What, 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 what uh, or your mind, is your mindset is, I come into this church, I'm going to volunteer. What can I do to create the context for blessing to flow? Okay, and I want everyone to think, go away today and think deeply. What is my contribution to the house? What is my contribution to my spiritual father? Am I serving at that level? I wrote a whole list here. In fact, Psalm 110 verse 3 says, watch this. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. Everyone say they'll volunteer freely. Don't volunteer with a price tag. <laughs> volunteer freely. Right? Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your, of your power. Right? Look at that in the New King James. Or the King James, it says, Your people will be willing in the day of your power. King James, your people will be willing in the day of your power. Now tell your neighbor, are you a willing servant? Right? Are you a willing servant? I said to God, I want to be... You know, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you know the text. Learn to be the servant of. Or when they discuss greatness, Jesus discussed greatness with his kingdom, with, the, with his disciples. He said, if you, he told him, if you want to be great in my kingdom, learn servitude. Learn to be the servant, not of some. Learn to be the servant of all. Learn to be the servant of, of all. We've adopted this mindset. Wherever comes for counseling in the office, uh, especially if it's not folk from our own church, right? And no matter how old or young they are, in that hour or an hour and a half or two, we adopt the mindsets, we're here to serve you. We're here to bless you, right? And let me just say this. The faithful man, Proverbs, you read it? There's a proverb that says, the faithful man will abound in blessings, right? And if you are faithful with little God will make you ruler over much. Matthew also says, if you're faithful with that which is another man's, God will give you your, your own. Now you've got to learn faithfulness with that which is another man's. Everyone say faithful with another man's. God will give you your own. So if you look at, for example, the father-son examples throughout the scripture. I wrote a list here quickly. Joshua served Moses. David's 30 men served David. Elisha served Elijah. Luke served Paul. Silas served Paul. Titus served Paul. Timothy served Paul. Epaphroditus served Paul. Priscilla and Aquila served Paul. Leaders in the book of Nehemiah supported Nehemiah. Jehoiada supported and served King Joash. Shekaniah served and supported Ezra in the book of Ezra. And Almabera supported Joshua. Esther supported Mordecai. Ruth supported Naomi. Women with wealth supported Jesus. Read it. 
You've got to support something and someone. The pattern is clear in Scripture that the moment you serve upward, you become the recipient for downloads from heaven. Come on, say, if I serve upward, I become the recipient of downloads from heaven. Right? You serve, the, serve the purposes of God vested in another. Okay, now everyone say one last thought. One last thought that this message is finished. I can do something else next week. <laughs> Tell someone one for the road. Like, this is now like Bansela. <laughs> but maybe the Bansela is the main thing, right? Watch this. Verse 8. And this hit me like a ton of bricks. And I shared this thought when I did. This was the primary thought I shared when I shared the invocation at the Gate Global Zoom meeting. Verse 8, Solomon is praying this, and Solomon says this to the Lord. Watch what he says. He says, your servant, everyone say your servant, is in the midst, everyone say in the midst, in the midst of your people, God. I love that. I simply love this. He's, remember he first said, you put me here, you made your servant king. Now he says, oh, by the way, he reminds God, not my people, these are your guys. Right? These are your group, this is your people. Okay, he's part of the group, but it reminds God, everything here, God, is about you, your purpose, your kingdom, your reputation, your peoples are at stake, which you have chosen a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. Now, this verse does not make sense. Why? Because there are not too many to be numbered or counted. If you take a population census, it will be relatively easy at this stage in the history to count and number. I mean, it's very simple. The whole nation got 12 tribes. Each tribe got clans. Each clan got households. Each household got families. Families, households, clans, tribes. And there are 12 tribes that make up whole. Easy to take a population census with that structure. Right? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right? And in fact, if you compare the bigness of Israel then to the surrounding nations, Every other nation around them was far bigger numerically then. So what on earth is he talking about too many? The key word here is in the word great. Everyone say a great people. And this is, I want to leave this with you, part of God's perspective towards you as a great people. Now say this with me. Say we are a great people. That's not arrogance. That's not pride. It's an understanding. Watch this. What does the word great mean here? The word is kabed, which is heavy, substantive, and qualitative. Heavy, everyone say heavy. heavy. Say substantive. substantive. Say qualitative. qualitative. Now, repeat this after we say, I'm a heavyweight. Heavy. Don't play with me, I'm a heavyweight. <laughs> okay. I jumped on the scale at the beckoning of my wife last night. She asked, when last have you weighed yourself? I said, I don't go by weighing anymore. I go by feeling. <laughs> if I'm feeling good, I'm all right. I don't trust that, that thing anymore. But it's been a while. So I said, well, about six, about 97, I should there be about kgs or so. And then when she wasn't looking, I thought, let me just check. <laughs> so it's been a while. And I jumped on, and I was so happy. The thing blessed me. It's a 95.7. Oh, powerful. I want to get, my goal is 90, by the way. I need to lose five kgs. Maybe one a kg a month for the next five months. Get to 90. Have you heard of the term punching above your weight? Boxing term? When I mean, it's like lightweights have a punch that's equivalent like maybe to a heavyweight. So the guy is able to punch above his weight. The force of his, just the way he punches, the effect is that of a way above someone his, his weight category. And God, God alerted me to this fact. And God said, Randolph, you're a great man. Don't be proud by it. It's not pompous. It's not arrogance. But understand how great you are. Just understand how great you are. And then, in the same week, Prophet Anthony is in India, traveling back, and he sends me a message regarding exactly the same thing, about perspective as to how do I see myself in the light of others viewing me? And for me, it was a word of confirmation. 
But what's a word to me is a word to all of you. You don't understand how great you are. I carry myself, I try to, in, in deep humility before people. I, I play things down because I want to become all things to all men. Well, Paul says, to the Jew I became a Jew. To the Greek I became a Greek. To the barbarian I became a, a, a barbarian. That if by any means I might win some to Christ. Right? So I will, I will put my training gear on at Virgin Active and appear like them. But that doesn't define who I am. I have heaviness. Everyone say heaviness. I want you to understand when you go to work, Nikki, when you go to work, understand your qualitative, substantive disposition. You are not a lightweight, you are heavyweight, right? Now some people don't take it the wrong way, right? Some people need to lose weight, <laughs> okay, do it natural way. But I'm saying your representation in the spirit is that you are a heavy weight. You're not some loose, flaky person, you are substantive. And you know when, 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 when Solomon said this to God, these people that you have given me to, to lead are heavyweights. They are substantive. Israel is different from every other nation. We might be small numerically by comparison, but there's a, there's a, there's a kabod here, a kabed. There's a substantive weight of glory present. And God asked me to say this to all of you. Gate Ministry is Durban Central. All of you who are sons in this house, I say to you, you are great. There's greatness in you that your eyes need to open up to. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at this verse 18, last verse, book is closed. Maybe not. No, book is closed. No. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints say this after me his inheritance in us do you have an inheritance in him yes but from his vantage point he's looking at the church and god is saying i have an inheritance vested in you and paul is saying i pray your eyes might be open to the wealth you represent toward god his perspective of you as a being. That's why David had this revelation. And he said, when he looked at the stars, the moon, the galaxies, he said, who am I? What is man that you are so mindful of me, puny little me on this planet, one of many in the, in the vast expanse of an ever-growing uh, 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 a solar system, right? Uh, and, and, and world of, of space, that's increasing rapidly, minute by minute. Who am I? I want you to understand your value. Now let me just say this to you. When you understand God's investment in you and who you are, you will never allow anybody else to disrespect you. Don't allow people to devalue you. Know your worth. Everyone say, know your worth. Know your worth. Um, you don't need to react to everything, but for example, don't present yourself to contexts that do not highly esteem you or understand your true value and what you represent. Solomon's idea is this. I'm king, sure, but these people are great people. There's substantive purpose vested in Israel towards the nations of the earth. I have to steward and lead this greatness, these people, Gate Global Family is a great people. Gate Ministries Durban Central is a great people. Substantive purpose. When I think of the individuals in this house, you don't know what you are. You are top notch. Tell someone top notch. You are what they call it, pedigree. Highest pedigree. Your ilk, your worth. I want to say this seriously to all of you. If no one has ever affirmed you, ever before. As your father in Christ, I say this to you. You are great. Not a small fry. Not flaky. You are great in God's sight. And whenever there's greatness at stake, God gives wisdom to administrate greatness. God gives wisdom 
to administrate greatness. You know what Jesus said to the woman at the well? If you only knew who is talking to you. Remember he said that to her? If you only knew who is talking to you, you would ask me for living water. And I'll give you this water. Some of us don't know when we are in the presence of greatness. If we only know our whole attitude, disposition will be entirely different. But also know, we also don't know when we are great in the midst of others that need to regard it. And then we diminish our own value by accepting behaviors towards us that make us feel less than what we should. Tell someone no more. No more, right? Last week I told you don't accept yes or no from someone that doesn't have the power to say yes. Right? Know who you are. Don't let anybody treat you shabbily. There's a new wisdom coming to your greatness. Right? A new wisdom, a skill, a sagacity by which you're going to navigate through life. I can't get away from this. The Lord calls you great. Remember the verse concerning Melchizedek in Hebrews 7? Consider how great this Melchizedek was, the writer of the book of Hebrews is, that even the patriarch gave him tithes and offerings. Consider how great he was. If you want to be great, learn to be the servant of all. Israel's greatness as a great nation was premised, prefaced on the, on, on, on the proviso that they as a nation are going to serve the purposes of God to all other nations, an element in which they obviously failed. But that was the idea. Their greatness was dependent upon their acts of servitude and their mind mentality of service to all. I, mean, I want you to stand. There's an old song. And she said the, the mic up, Jeremy. There's an old song that we used to sing. If you want to be great, maybe the worship team can come and join me, in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Who remembers this? Old Sunday school. Okay, I'm taking you back now, okay? Sunday school days. But I think it's a, an appropriate um, song to sing. If you want to be great, in God's kingdom Learn to be the servant of all the smart If you want to be great In God's kingdom Learn to be the servant Learn to be the servant of all See again, if you want to be great If you want to be great in God's kingdom Learn to be the servant of all Learn to be the servant of all If you want to be great If you want to be great In God's kingdom Learn to be the servant of all Learn to be the servant of all Now just sing Learn to be the servant of all Learn to be the servant of all. Learn to be, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great, in God's kingdom Learn to be the servant of all Learn to be Learn to be the servant of all Learn to be the servant of all If you want to be great God's kingdom. Learn to be, learn to be the servant of. One more time, if you want to be, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. If you want to be great. 
God's kingdom Learn to be the servant of all Let's lift our hands, all of us We're going to pray for wisdom Father, we ask in Jesus' name That you'd give us wisdom We don't know everything We don't know how to come in and how to go out your servants are little child, little children in the midst of the great tasks and responsibilities that you have given us. We don't know everything, but we know you who is omniscient. You know the end from the beginning. And Father, today we acknowledge our own deficiencies as we come before you in humility. I pray you'd fill the gaps in our understanding, fill the gaps in our knowledge, fill the gaps in our wisdom, O oh God. I ask, O oh God, that you would endow us with understanding, endow us with knowledge, with discretion, with judgment, with discernment. Touch our hearts, extend the borders of our hearts, enlarge our minds to receive your wisdom. And today we commit to being servants of all. We want to be the servants of all, Father, as we pray. Oh God, we want to serve your purposes like David did in his generation. Help us not to betray this generation. Help us to not to be untrue to the current generation, but to serve your purposes in and through their lives, Father. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. Learn to be, learn to be the servant of all. to be the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Amen. Great grace and abundant peace be with you all. Yes, communion. Please receive your emblems. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we celebrated communion each night as we prayed for Cyril. It was so powerful. Uh, every time we do the sacrament, we receive grace, health, long life in the name of the Lord. Amen. You know, the Bible says concerning him, Philippians 2, that though being equal with God, he thought it not, though being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but did what? Made himself a servant, took upon himself the form of a servant, and being found in the likeness of man, he humbled himself unto death, even the death of a cross. If he chose servanthood, to serve the purposes of God, his Father on the cross, then we can too. So receive the grace for servanthood today as you remember him. Receive his body, receive his blood. Just one heads up. We're going to start prophetic training with uh, Prophet Sean Blicknot soon. We're just waiting for one or two more confirmations, and I'll give the announcement. It'll be finalized by next week, Sunday. But this is going to be like an eight to ten week training program. It's going to be for one hour only each time we meet. It'll either be like on a Sunday evening or Monday evening. Um, it either is going to be every week or every second week for now. We're just waiting for Sean to confirm in terms of his own personal schedule. But that's going to be something powerful. I want you to keep praying. We're going to all go into this prophetic training being praying people so that the training is beneficial for everyone. Amen. He's been doing it with some groups and it's got great success attached to it. And I know it's going to bless you as a prophetic people. Great grace and abundant peace. Blessings.